GM, GM, welcome to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. Don't get caught in the hype cycle. I'm Jay Bird, joined by my co-host Kyle Reedhead, and we believe that on-chain data is going to change the world. That's why we're carving a path for doers to confidently build and invest in Web3. You know, I've been really excited for this episode, knowing that we were going to get Dune on the podcast. We've been users of Dune for a long time. If you're a pro member of ours, we literally share Dune charts uh, every single week, all the time in our Discord channel. So I don't know that there's a tool in Web3 that I use more than, than Dune. It's been a long time coming to finally get them on the podcast. And I think the reason why I love this conversation, outside of just like learning about Dune and, and what they're thinking about where the on-chain world is going to go, is... Dune's had an incredible story, right? They've been around, their OGs have been around since, what, 2017. They've gone through bull market, bear market, bull market, bear market, uh, and <laughs> what now we're, whatever, hopefully in a, in a bull market. And so they've been through those ups and downs, that roller coaster, and he talks all, us through that entire story in this episode, and it was um, just a, a great story to hear. Yeah, I think the big thing that stands out to me from this episode, my big takeaway is when you start a business, you don't necessarily know what your product's going to be. You 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 know what you think it's going to be. And in Dune's case, they had a plan of a product. They went and they sold that to a customer. And then they ended up firing their customers because they realized that they needed to pivot to a different product. And that was probably the biggest, Matt's talks about how it was probably the best decision they made when they decided to focus on a community open source platform where anybody could build dashboards rather than a closed system, which was a big risk. That's difficult to do as a founder. And Matt's and Frederick, his co-founder, clearly have got big cojones to make these big decisions. And that's part of this story that Matt's talks about is really just that like grit and that grind to keep on going and really to make big bets. And it's tough to make big bets in this space, but that's what you got to do. And so awesome to hear that story from from the founder himself. Yeah. And to give a bit of context, I don't think we really explained exactly what Dune is in the podcast, which is kind of no. funny. We just dove into this story, assuming everyone knows Dune. But if you don't know what Dune is, uh, essentially, it is a tool that allows you to pull data from, um, from on-chain across many different uh, blockchains. Uh, and you can pull it using SQL, just like a language code, and and then you can turn it into charts. And so you can pull, you know, Ethereum transactions. You can pull the volume that's locked in protocols on specific apps. You can basically pull any data from any smart contract. So whether it's NFTs, it's you know fungible tokens, it's wallets, it's whatever. You can get it all. Obviously, that has incredible implications to it, right? This data is extremely useful from trying to understand who's using what applications, trying to understand how much money is where, how money's flowing, how revenues are being created uh, across apps, where expenses are. Like, it's Especially when things are on chain, you have so much more transparency. And so you can get so much more data than we can on businesses and use cases that are not on chain. And Dune is really that tool that's allowing us to get all that. Obviously, again, we use it all the time in our newsletter. So many of you have seen it. We sh often show Dune charts on YouTube for our podcast. So um, you've likely seen it, whether you know it or not, um, but it's a it's a very, very useful tool in uh, in Web3. And the other thing just to mention quickly is we talk about this episode, one new feature that Dune is working on is the integration with AI. And Matt's talks about how important that is to their future and what they are doing really to allow crypto data to become more accessible to the masses. I won't get into the details. You have to listen to the show to understand that, but uh, really interesting. Always love seeing this combination of blockchain and AI. We talk about it all the time on the show. AI is part of Web3 and it is really what is, it's equally part of this next big phase of the internet. And here's an example of a company integrating both and a founder who really believes that AI could be the next big thing in order to help them achieve their mission. So yeah, really, really love seeing that. We don't see that enough. Let's jump in, but before we do, we'll just take a minute to hear from our sponsors. Modern newsletters are built on Paragraph. That's right. Paragraph is a brand new newsletter platform that combines the best parts of Web 2 and Web 3 to supercharge newsletters for both writers and readers. Build a community, not just an audience. Paragraph uses blockchain tech to allow readers 
to collect and own the words that matter to them. This takes reading a newsletter to the next level. With Paragraph, readers can mint, collect, and show off quotes from their favorite newsletters. This opens new possibilities like creators sharing revenue with fans. I also love their new feature, Paragraph AI. This integrates GPT-4 natively in Paragraph to create, edit, and improve your writing effortlessly with one click. And guess what? We at Web3 Academy are on board and have already moved our content over to Paragraph. We believe this is the future of newsletters because of the profound engagement it creates between creators and fans. So whether you're a creator, writer, or an avid reader, it's time to check out Paragraph and capitalize on the opportunity of being early. GM Matz, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Well, we're, we're so excited to have you for so many reasons. One, Dune, obviously, massive part of the Web3 ecosystem, but also a big part of our business at Web3 Academy. We use Dune for our pro reports every week. We wouldn't be here without you. So deep bow of gratitude. Really excited to get into your story. I want to start off with sort of going back to the beginning because you guys have got such an interesting founder's story, really a true story of what it's like to start a business, to go through the trenches, to you know pivot your business, your product along the way, to struggle of not making revenue in the beginning. I know I've heard Frederick, your co-founder, talk about that before. Can you give us sort of, in your own words, taking us back to the beginning of the origin story of Dune? Yeah, for sure. And it's interesting timing as well, because we're just closing in on five years since we founded the company. So I think the the actual date is like September 1st or something, while the first piece of code was written end of July, five years ago. Yeah, we were two guys in Oslo with corporate jobs who got pilled on crypto in 2017. We lost a bunch of money <clears throat> over the course of 2017-2018 drop. And somehow still found ourselves talking about crypto, you know, at work, over coffee, over beers, and eventually decided, you know, we can't be on the outside of this. This is just too exciting. There's too much stuff here. It makes too much sense. And so my background was as a data scientist. So it was pretty natural for me to start looking, digging into the data. We had done some work already with prototypes, with smart contracts, et cetera, but it wasn't really my strong suit. But fetching the data and structuring it was both a strong suit for me, but also like non-existent in the space in 2018. Like literally every application was, you know, very recently funded and was rolling their own sort of data indexing stuff. I think Dune was founded about the same time as the graph, which is another project that, you know, tries to solve data for uh, crypto companies. And so it was just a massive lift at the beginning. And we, like our journey took us back and forth. We had no salary for, I think, eight or 10 months, something like that in the beginning. That was pretty brutal. We were quite literally two weeks from folding down the company when we were accepted into like our first incubator. And so at that point, you know, we spent all our money to go to eat Denver. Like literally the last piece of money we had in Dune which was, I think, $2,000 or something, 1500 wow. to go to Denver, fly to Denver, and go to the hackathon and meet people. And we found investors there. It's pretty unimaginable that that could happen. What year was that? Um, what year? Yeah, what year was that? It was 2020, must have been? 2020? 2020, really? Okay. Wait, no, no. Two, no, it could have been because it's canceled. I think that year. 2019. 2019? Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Wow. 2019. What was the yeah. initial product that you planned when you first started Dune? What did you think the product was going to be? Who did you think your customers were going to be? We thought we would build something like Google Analytics or Mixpanel or Amplitude for the product teams. You know, people need to understand how their products are used. And we thought that, you know, just like in the Web2 world, it's like the internal stakeholders that matter the most. Like our vision was to build, you know, basically that preset dashboards that would 
measure your retention, your core analysis, your activation rates, all that stuff. And we were working on that until someone said, just stop, just give me the data. <laughs> just literally give me access to your database and I will pay you. And that was Nadav, who's the CTO at OpenSea today. He was back then, he was a CEO of a company called Dharma. And that was our first customer, first break, like literally the first money we received. And I scrambled, like I'm the engineer in the co-founding relationship. And so I scrambled hard to get in that data, but we did. So you, you thought you were going to be this Google Analytics. You got this customer, you got in this incubator. Whoever that incubator is, I want to kiss them on the lips because thank God that they brought you in and you were two weeks away from closing. Well, what would we do without Dune? So happy that we have you. So, but you mentioned that you had like eight to 10 months of no salary. Like, and I think this is the thing that so many startup founders and so many of our listeners miss in this space is it's so easy to look at the projects that make it and be like, oh, they must have always been successful, right? We don't hear yeah. enough of the stories of like the struggle and the suffer. And I think right now, a lot of people are feeling that. We're in a bear market. You started doing in the bear market of 2019. How did you keep going? What kept you going during that time of that suffering and that struggle? Yeah, that's a great question and hyper relevant for today where, you know, if you look at the amount of funding that goes into crypto, it's falling off a cliff, right? So what kept us going was ultimately conviction in crypto a conviction and, you know, the need for like a data layer for the people who are building this stuff. 10 months, even after we raised our first funding, you know, all we heard was like, this is not big enough. This isn't going to work. There's not enough crypto companies. It's not novel enough. We need data, you know, and the tr people we tried to sell to at that time, they would go to Etherscan and check how many transactions happened the day before, mm -hmm. because it was, you can literally count them. Like you could, if you were the CEO of some company in crypto, you could go to Etherscan and count while well, there was 12 users on my product yesterday. So actually selling someone who's in that, selling a data tool to someone in that position, is pretty hard. <laughs> you don't need a chart if you can, you know, just count it. Unsolicited advice is, you know, like, don't give up. You have to stay in the game, be alive in order to succeed. And I think there are many companies, many startups over the last couple of years who basically could race without showing to anything. And, you know, that's very comfortable, but at the end of the day, you have to show, show something and money is not always the answer to that. Actually. So like you kind of took us up to 2019, 2020, you guys made it through, you got some investment. And then the next few years were really good in crypto, right? 2020, 2021, things went crazy. There's two things that come to mind for me is one, when you built Dune, NFTs didn't, well, technically didn't really exist, or at least we're not prop, like popular at all, right? Now it's the it's a big use case for Dune for sure. It's, everyone's looking at what's going on with NFTs and you can see it all from on there. So interested to hear like the story around that of, did you guys catch on to that right off the bat? Was that something that you guys kind of missed or like what happened there? And then I guess the other thing is for Dune to succeed, the one thing you were really waiting for was like everything needed to go on chain. And now we're in the middle of on chain summer, right? It seems like a lot is happening on chain finally. There's a lot of things launching. Even though we're not yet in a full on bull market, on chain activity is definitely picking up. And we'll talk a bunch about that after. But just curious about those two specific points in your guys' journey of like, okay, NFTs came about. How did that go down with Dune? And then now that finally things are really happening on chain, what's that been like? Yeah, those are great questions and spot on. We at one point fired our customers. And before there was a lot of, we said, you are paying us a thousand dollars a month to access this data in a database. However, we will offer this for free on a website. So you can create an account here and do the same thing that you do for free and hope you'll create an account. And did, did you have investors at this point? Your investors must have been like, what the heck are you doing? Yeah. We, we had that first investor and that was pretty crazy, but it was like the pivotal moment for Dean. So we basically took this data and turned it inside out, right? We built a platform that let, lets anyone look at the data points, not just the product manager in a company, 
but the product manager of their competitor, their token holders, their investors, anyone who's interested in the entire world. Like internally, we call this like the stakeholder explosion. Like there's just so many more people who are interested in the data in crypto than there is in Web2 or other industries. Just so many more people. And so we did that. And that was like, didn't really work. <laughs> For a long time, it did not really work. Not a lot of users came. We had a few. We had a few really good ones that, you know, Frederick and I were basically, I was spending my Friday nights with a user in New York and on Telegram, helping him write SQL. Like one-on-one on one with one on the user. Yes. <laughs> and Frederick too. When I didn't do it, Frederick did it with the one user. And we did it with a couple. And eventually we formed a little Telegram group where these people, where the users could help know each other. And before we knew it, this thing that didn't really work kind of hit was DeFi summer. Remember that? Like suddenly there were like a new crazy DeFi product being created every day. <laughs> and there was one key property of Dune that made us so central in that, which was our data stack allowed us to basically make sort of decoded or human readable data for any smart contract in a manner of seconds. Like any user could give us like the ABI that decodes the encoded data and we would be up and running. And so we had such fast turnaround and while it wasn't like permissionless, like I was like 24 seven, like just like adding all these requests and suddenly during that summer, like do you know what's everywhere? And after that, we were able to actually raise the seed round that we kind of had to scrape together, to be honest, but we managed at least. Then the second sort of huge moment, obviously, was NFTs. And I think these two moments are pivotal in crypto history. NFTs uh, were everywhere a couple of years ago and still are. And so Dune also, that was fantastic for Dune's growth. And I think also Dune was fantastic for the growth of NFTs because we could help everyone understand and audit, help with transparency, volumes, whether or not you're a trader or whatever. Gina worked for you during that time. It still does. So yeah, those are the, the two big moments. And yes, I'm hoping that on-chain summer is something similar, not just because it would be great for Gina, obviously, but also because I'm having a lot of fun. Yeah. There's a lot of cool apps. And I think the word on the street is obviously friend tech, which is novel and cool and weird and buggy, <laughs> but it's just exploding. All right. And so I feel like someone, like if it's Coinbase or Optimus or whoever it is, they're manifesting some sort of like bull market for on-chain activity and, and I'm here for it. Yeah, us too. The vibes are back. Everybody's excited. Our podcast, the roll-up that we do every week, we do a news roll-up every week and it's been fun again. And the news is like the energy's good. You know, it's, yeah, it's exciting to see. So we talked about what it's like to struggle through a startup and the bear market. I just want to flip it because we talk a lot about on the show is trying to encourage people like, hey, we're almost there, right? Who knows when the bull market comes, but we're seeing early signs. You mentioned on-chain summer, the vibes are high, things are happening. And you mentioned that you had to scrape together your seed round, which I think was 8 million that you raised for your seed round. But then- 2 million. 2 million, okay, 2 million. Yeah. But then you did a much bigger raise- during the bull market. And I've heard stories, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you turned down some big money at that point because everybody wanted a piece and all of a sudden things were happening. So I'm just curious for our listeners, I'd love to hear you tell the story of like that difference of what it's like to when all of a sudden all the energy is coming in, people are coming on chain and how that impacts fundraising, how that impacts your team and the energy how that impacts the users and your community versus what it was like during the bear, just because I think we're getting close to that. And I want our users to like know that that is coming and to hear from you what that's like. It is pretty wild, actually, when things turn around like overnight. They don't really turn around overnight, or it, they didn't for Dune, but it felt like over the course of a very short time, Dune went from something that was very niche into like more of a mainstream product. And investors that we had talked to before and they had passed on us many times, we did hundreds of 
calls and emails and telegram pings, et cetera, they would suddenly ping us. So after, after we had raised the seed, so the year after we hadn't spent any of that seed money really. And, but suddenly we were getting messages like, Hey, you racing. It took a few of those to ask ourselves, should we be racing? (laughs) Maybe we should race. And so we talked to to some firms, some new, and someone some who had rejected us before, and we went with USV for our Series A, uh, rejected us for the seat. And so those were sort of the partners we wanted. So we were very happy to secure that funding, and with that firm. But yeah, the whole that week, I think I speak for both myself and Frederick was the most intense week of running you never. We were basically uncool. We were not in the game, like we were flying to these crypto events trying to pretend we were part of the scene. And then in the course of one week, we went from like not racing to having signed our $8 million Series A with one of the world's best VC terms. And we signed that on Friday night after coming off a call where we turned turned down another investor with a higher offer. And it was brutal. It was super brutal. And as a founder, of course, it's kind of like the best situation you can be in, but it's still brutal. So we needed to decompress a little bit after that. <laughs> yeah. At this point, Dean was like five people, I mean, five or six people. How, how big is the team now? Around 40, 45. Wow. Okay. So you guys seem some good growth. When was that that you guys, you guys had your, um, your $8 million investment? It was, so I'm, Notoriously bad with dates, but it has to be one, right? I yeah, think that's a good thing. Must have been or early 2022, but probably 2021. Well, because I know that you did your Series B in 2022. So when you raised yes. so it is nine million four hundred and twenty thousand, which is just the most beautiful Web three crypto number of all time. Yeah, I think it that number reflects the mania of the bull market. If I'm being perfectly honest, that race was, you know, very well timed. Again, we had the opportunity to decide whether or not we wanted to race, and we decided to make a joke out of it. There were other companies that also raised a lot of money who made jokes about it. But yeah, that was also intense. I'd love to hear your thoughts on sort of where things go from here, and you can talk in the perspective of Dune specifically or on chain specifically if you prefer. I think one of the things that we've seen a big trend on. We just had um, the founder of Zapper on our podcast as well. And we talked a lot about just like a lot of things are going to happen on chain. I think they already are, but I think more and more things will go on chain. And the one big thing is we need that. There's a lot of data there and we need that to be readable. There's many ways to make it readable, right? There's the Etherscan way, which is like tables. There's Dune, which is charts. There's Zapper, which is like a feed and more sort of a social aspect of it. And I think we need all of them for many different reasons, right? And so I think Dune plays like a massive role in sort of that charting side of it and having the ability to do whatever you want with that data. Curious on what's next. Like you said, okay, it used to be DeFi and you guys were sort of charting all that. Then it was NFTs. Any thoughts on like where things go or like maybe even what's just the vision of Dune heading into the future? Do you guys have other products, different ideas? Do you have maybe a certain thought of where the like things are going to go on chain and you're preparing for that? Like what are you guys preparing for right now? Yeah, great question. I think... It is very hard to predict what the next big thing is in crypto. Same. <laughs> <laughs> we don't necessarily try to predict what the next big thing is, but we definitely, need, you know, we don't work on one thing all the time. We have a few different in the fire. So if I were to say, like, what are some things that we need to work on? That's like preparing you even more for a world where there is more chance. And maybe a world where the chain doesn't matter as much, like a more application-focused way of doing sort of data analysis. Yeah. I think right now we're all, you know, analyzing this app on Ethereum or on Base or on Solana. But I think at least in the sort of EVM ecosystem, that part is like kind of slowly but surely being abstracted away a little bit. At least with some of the wallets that I use, like this process is becoming more seamless. The bridging, I didn't know what chain base was on. Like that's pretty seamless onboarding experience. And 
even if I knew it was, sorry, friend.tech was on base, even if I knew it was on base, it didn't matter to me. Like, and so I think that's, that's one of the things that it's going to get really interesting. It's like, I guess, leveling up, leveling up that, because we also see you know, some protocols like Uniswap being deployed on how many chains. Right. And doing that is really interesting. And then of course, our mission is to make crypto data accessible. And I think this year, probably the most impactful technology to make anything accessible hit the spotlight, which is large language models, uh, GPT-4 and chat GPT, right? And so we've been investing a lot in making Dune more accessible through the use of a natural language interface. So currently we have a, a few different features out that lets you interact with the SQL query in, in natural language, lets you specify in English what you're after. And these are building blocks towards like a greater mission of like interacting with Dune, maybe with only natural language and not necessarily the SQL underneath. So baby steps and building blocks, but yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Let, let's just touch on that one a little bit further. So for those who haven't used Dune, you need to use a, I don't know if you want to call it language or whatever called SQL or SQL. And I mean, not everyone knows that. So that means that the data in Dune is not necessarily accessible to everyone. I mean, we use Dune all the time. I don't write SQL, which means we had to hire someone to do that for us. And so what you're saying, I guess, or tell me if this is sort of your idea here with using AI, large language models, is eventually there's a world, or maybe it already exists, I'm not sure, where I can say, I want to see how many users are transacting on Frentech, you know, over the last 30 days and show me it weekly. Instead of writing that in code via SQL, I can just write that in normal language and AI will basically translate that into the SQL and then it'll spit out the data for me. Is that the end goal? Exactly. That's exactly the angle. And so we think that this, you know, enables anyone out. So everyone who goes to Dune, whether or not they write SQL or they browse dashboards, they come with a question. Like inherently they're trying to figure out something right. that they did not know before. And so I think English is kind of the ultimate interface for mm. Q&A. And so we're pretty excited to, to build towards that mission. And I want to make it clear, I, I don't think it's like next week there, <laughs> right. but for some limited use cases, you can go and do today and actually say, you know, what were the top grossing NFT pair on OpenSea the last 24 hours? And we can actually answer that without you writing a single line of code. That's super cool. And yeah, that's huge. That's huge. Like I, th I think that it's easy for maybe if our listeners haven't used Doom before, that is a massive unlock in terms of bringing you closer to your mission and making crypto accessible to everybody. Because as Kyle said, most people don't know SQL. So, and they're not going to go I learn SQL, but now you're able through this new tool, which I believe is called Create Wand. I think is the name yeah. of this new LLM tool. In doing prep for the show, I was I was playing around with it, and I think it's just amazing what it can do. Here's why I think it's such a big deal: is I see Ethereum or or blockchains in general as like a truth machine, right? Like you can go to it and you can verify what's actually happening in the world. You can't do that with anything that's not on chain for the most part. And so the interesting thing is, like on Twitter all the time, I see data that's just completely wrong. People making up numbers. And then you just go to, I go to Dune immediately and I just search WorldCoin or I search Frentech and like, I can either, like we either have the dashboards or someone else has created them and I can go in and I can just see the live data. And to me, it's like, okay, there's the truth, right? What I got on Twitter was completely wrong, but I can go to Dune. And so two things kind of come on this. I see Dune as like, and I don't know if you guys see it this way, is like, does Dune end up becoming almost like a search engine? Because I find myself, you can't go to Google and be like, how many users are on Frentech? Because there's no information there. You're going to read some shitty articles and some headlines. But I find myself going to Dune more frequently and actually searching on Dune. And so like, there's not social components yet on Dune. But this is my other question is like, not only just a search engine, but does it become a almost like a social platform? Because people have accounts on there. I have names that I typically go to. You can already like star their dashboards and stuff. You can't comment and things like that. But like, I could see it as a social media tool at some point. And a search engine. I'm not sure if those are something you guys think of at Dune, but that's that's sort of what I've gathered. Yeah, no, that's great. Definitely have thought about both. 
and you know like a few years back maybe i caught myself in a delusional moment comparing our, ourselves to google or something like that <laughs> so i like your phrasing about a truth machine but it's a very like cumbersome truth machine and yeah. there needs to be tools like you and others that help surface that truth and so if you think about how dune does that basically we do that through a community of analysts so one valid approach when we sort of pivot to dune from being this google analytics thing would be we're just going to hand write all the dashboards that matter like frederick and me and our team are just going to specify what matters and there were a few different competitors at the time that did that and they're not around <laughs> and so what Dune really did was like capitalize on the sort of collective intelligence of the people in crypto. And I think that was our best move ever. And um, try to create as good of a move in the future, but it's pretty difficult. But yeah, like that goes to say that there's a social element to it too. Like these are human beings, people who are creating content, sharing on Twitter, gaining cloud, gaining sh- uh, gaining stars. Some get jobs, others work on Dune as their full-time job. So I wouldn't rule out sort of any of those two. I don't think Dune has decided to be a search engine, and I don't think we've decided to be a social network. But there are elements of both that I think we we should have and be better on. Like search on Dune needs to be better. That's just period. Whether or not Dune is a search engine company, it just needs to be better. Right. We're working I mean- on that. There's definitely something in the content creation because like even us, like our Twitter account, we have weekly posts that go out that are just screenshots of our Dune charts, right? And I, yeah. it's all over Twitter. I follow a ton of, I think you call them Dune wizards. They're doing the same thing. So like a lot of content and really good content is being created from Dune. But unfortunately, we have to screenshot and move it over. It'd be nice if somehow it's integrated into Lens and Farcaster and maybe one day Twitter. But I could see that because it's a great content creating machine with very, very valuable information. Sure. Yeah. There's no excuse for not having those like share buttons. The engineer <laughs> founder is like right away. He's like, you're right. I didn't go. You're right. I need to go back. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to pull out one thing that you said, and you've brought it up sort of twice now, I think, which is community around dude. You said early on, you had that telegram group and you brought people in. The users could help the other users kind of use Dune. And then you just said, there was others, I think you're referring to things like DeFi Pulse and others where you could just go on the site, they would give you some data, but they would make it themselves and there was nothing else to it. Most of those are no longer existing except for like, I don't know, DeFi Llama, I guess is one. But Dune, the power of Dune is like, there's so many people creating dashboards, like on a scale that you and Frederick could have never done yourselves. And also, I mean, I just met a lot of people in the Dune community. If you go in the Discord as well, there's so many people on there and so many people building things. Talk to us a little bit about building community because we always talk about the importance of that in any business, Web3 or otherwise. But obviously that's been probably the key thing for you guys. It sounds like walk us through that story of community building. Maybe if there's tips you have, I'm not sure what that brings up for you, but we'd just love to hear you talk mm-hmm. about community with dude. Yeah, and like I want to make it clear that for a long time, we looked at tools that were more prescriptive. And, you know, their way of presenting data or their dashboards. And we said, oh man, they have it so easy. But if we knew what people were trying to do with Dune, like it would be a lot easier. We've definitely looked to some tools like that in Envy from time to time because the flexibility that Dune gives you is like a double-edged sword in a sense. It means that, you know, probably the world's best NFT dashboard, probably not going to be built on Dune as it is today. Why? Because... Dune is a general broad tool that lets you go infinitely deep and broad into the data. It's hard for us to do that and build like the world's best interface for a specific use case. Mm-hmm. So that was something we grappled a lot with in the start, like figuring out where the right balance to strike is. Should we, so during DeFi summer, we would, were asking ourselves, should we build a DeFi dashboard? We actually built a DeFi dashboard, but on Dune, which was pretty popular, but not as popular as some of the dedicated sites. And then I guess we probably asked ourselves during the NFT boom as well, should we build something specialized in this use case? It's a difficult trade-off. But speaking of community, I think we've always opted on the side of the creator and the people who create. And 
this is a, I think, glorious thing with Dune and other tools that are sort of free form is that we all have a creator inside of us. We all have cur- curiosity and a drive to create. And so being on the sort of team of the creator is something we've always tried to do. And in fact, we had a strategy, a company strategy at one point that was called Wizards, Wizards, Wizards. That was literally the strategy. And it's all about the people creating the dashboards on Dune. I don't know exactly how the community formed around Dune. I think there was a part of it I attribute to Frederick and to a little bit my, myself, like actually talking to all these users and people and getting them in a virtual room together. And there being like a tighter core in the beginning like your power users, if you will, kind of like, you know, a very early user council in a sense, like they would send feature requests, they would help each other with queries, et cetera. And, you know, we would mostly listen and discuss and chime in and shit. And from there, I think you can't understate the importance of X or Twitter has had on Dune, the distribution channel that it has provided, seeing that the crypto community is mainly there has been just an incredible boost to the distribution of not just Dune as a company, but also like the individual wizard or creator, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, When you create on Dune and you share, share it on Twitter, sometimes you hit a nerve and you get millions of impressions and thousands of of stars of Dune Mm -hmm. on Dune. I'd like to say that we were very deliberate in the Lily community, but um, yeah. Sometimes product market yeah. fit just can do that, right? Like it was just a tool that people needed and enough people needed them at the right time that boom, a community pops up around them. That that can be, sometimes community is just as simple as that, I think. But I think you were deliberate without maybe knowing it in that probably the best thing that anybody can do to build community is to go slow in the beginning and right. to you have to take the time to meet your users and your customers one-on-one and to give them that special attention, like a a one-on-one telegram with the founder. Think about how many companies would start and they would never give their customers one-on-one support, right? Like they would never even think about that. But that's the Web 2 way because in Web 2, it's like scale, 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 right? Whereas in Web 3, I think what we learned is we've all learned that If you build slower in the beginning and if you build with your community and you give them that one-on-one attention, you know, you telegram group, you take the time to do a Zoom call with them, right? Kyle in our community has done Zoom calls one-on-one with so many of our community members. The exponential relationship that you get from that, the trust that you get from that is huge. So I think you guys were doing it and you had the exact tactic nailed. You just maybe didn't write the strategy down. It's kind of counterintuitive in a way that if you focus on like a few that may grow a lot, that is sort of virality in a sense that, you know, like if you have 10 people and each of them tell 10 people and each of them tell 10 people. I remember though now actually that we did do a few things with the product to build more of a community or to like lean a little bit more into it. Like the first version of Dune didn't have the notion of a user profile. <laughs> Like you just had a randomly generated like a photo next to your query or dashboard and there was a username, but you couldn't click it or anything. So basically your Twitter, you didn't have a profile. So eventually we built a profile and the second thing we did was we added sort of favoriting or stars, starring. And the third thing was we built a leaderboard <laughs> of wizards. So we basically just right people with the amount of stars that they had and that's been interesting i think at a few occasions that has come up it's a feature that i thought that doesn't matter Mm. but you know occasionally there are people who care a lot about being number three it's silly but there's some like extra incentive to like put the extra work in and build something that a lot of people want one collect feature. You said there's star. That's an engagement. I want collect. I want to be able to make a chart that mint it as an NFT and allow people to collect it. <laughs> Just like we do. We do that with our articles with Paragraph. That'd be a sick idea. <laughs> and my brain's going. Kyle, Kyle's is coming to this podcast. 
all these ideas I, didn't even, I just thought that right now i was like oh they're starry we should have collect just because we've been using that with newsletters and it's great do you want to hire a new consultant here uh, yeah i'll send you a telegram after this <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, I want to touch on a, just a little bit more about the Duneverse and the Dune Wizards because I do think it's important to highlight that this entire economy is being built on top of Dune. And these creators are leaving their jobs, making, you know, having full time income coming from basically working on Dune dashboards and building Dune dashboards and whether that leads them to get consulting gigs or whether they're just growing on Twitter and becoming influencers and they're monetizing that way. I'm not exactly sure how they're monetizing. And and I remember one particular that stands out in my mind is Hill Dobby during the NFT royalty wars that happened. And everybody was all of a sudden, you know, Blur was exploding and everyone was trying to figure out what was going on with royalties and how Blur was growing so fast. And then Hill Dobby started diving into it on Dune and realized that it, most of Blur was all wash trading and oh my gosh, that was like a big unlock. I'm just curious, do you have any any stories like that? What's it been like to see these people grow into full-time businesses and to be creating on top of Dune and making their own their own income and their own salary as a result of your product? You know, first of all, that stuff is really rewarding. Like the few messages that we've gotten that you know something like you changed my life i didn't know sequel now i work at x or i'm an influencer or something like that i think if you ever if you build a product there's literally nothing better you can hear right that you change someone's life and their tra- trajectory there's a few cases that comes to mind that first user that we talked about that we chatted with one-on-one friday nights and telegram he leads venture at uniswap now and did not you know sequel be when starting to work on the was a journalist at the block i think early okay. early journalist at the block and was interested in data and so started yeah nagging me and frederick and so that was an incredible journey to to witness a little bit and i think the three of us consider ourselves friends now pretty special relationship in the beginning at very least that's the thing with crypto and maybe with every sort of maybe specifically with crypto is that there's just so much opportunity like if you put some work in like if you apply yourselves not just on dune but like building prototypes on your favorite chain or with your favorite data indexing framework or whatever there's a lot of space for like growing and building and maintaining a following there's a lot of jobs i think starkly maybe a little bit less right now but <laughs> great <laughs> thing about bear markets it's creating your own job we touched about touch on that a bit earlier that even though it's a bear market it's a great time to build we were so build. early we're so so early and that's the thing that we remind our listeners of all the time and when you're so early there is so much opportunity, right? Like that's the thing that I think mo- it's hard to see that right now in a bear market because there is less jobs and a lot of stuff that is being put out by social media or by news outlets is negative and NFTs are dead. I mean, I, God, if I hear that one more time, I'm going to freaking flip my desk. Like <laughs> not dead folks, just PFPs. We're a hype cycle, just PFPs. Like we're going to get past this. NFTs are huge. So I think that like when you are so early and you guys experienced this, you know, you went to hackathons, you show up again and again. And if you do that, it's so funny. The opportunities that will come from that will be tenfold more than you could ever expect. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think the other thing is like in an industry that's still so new, as you said, we're so early, building a business is hard enough to figure out how to make profitable, but then doing it in an industry where you're like, I don't know what the next thing is gonna happen in this industry, like you just talked about with NFTs, et cetera, it makes it even harder. And so I kind of want to transition this conversation into the business of Dune, right? There's a lot of businesses in crypto, Web3 that just don't have, I mean, in tech in general, that just don't have a real business, right? They're like, they just, they keep getting funding and there's no profits coming They're in. building a metaverse, right? Every, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> metaverse. <laughs> But Dune, I mean, Dune's got something real here. Like we said, real community, a lot of people using it, a lot of people getting incomes and salaries and jobs as a result of Dune. 
what students and feel free to go, you know, talk about whatever you want here, but like what students business model and kind of future with this. Obviously there's been a lot of talk on Twitter about Dune Token and we won't touch on that here today because it's not a thing. It doesn't exist. So don't even try people. But you know, so then outside of that, like what is the model for Dune? Do you guys have something in mind already or do you have plans for the future? Or what's what can you talk about there? Dune for better or worse is pretty traditional in a sense and how we approach making money. So obviously most people I think know Dune as a sort of like a community around a data tool and there's all these individuals that create and all these individuals that consume but there are also a bunch of crypto startups crypto companies financial institutions etc that use Dune and need this data and so our approach so far to sort of monetizing or becoming a business has been you know we want the best crypto teams out there to use Dune for their data needs. And we think a lot of things follow from that. If we can sort of convince or build something that convinces data teams that prominent crypto companies to build on Dune, a lot follows from it. And also the observation that sort of led to that is exactly this of opportunity for individuals on Dune. Like a lot of people who quote unquote sort of grew up on Dune found themselves with a job at some crypto companies, right? And we want them to be able to continue to use Dune in their roles. And so our focus there has been, I think the main focus has been to shift Dune from like a single player, like individual product to something that you can use in a team, something you can use with your coworkers or, you know, your co-community or however you call that. So that's our approach. We, like you said, aren't doing a token. We're pretty, pretty standard in our approach. So are you making revenue right now? Yes. How? We sell to these companies. Okay. So, and what's that? Is that like a monthly subscription? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's a, uh, pretty normal SaaS subscription fee monthly. We have two self-serve plans that are priced at $400 and $1,000. They are both as many seats as you'd like. So you can invite your entire company, be that 10 people or a thousand actually. Then yeah, we also have sort of enterprise features that are more tailored to the, the bigger companies. And then how do you balance the free side? Will there always be a free side? Obviously, that's a big part, I'm guessing, of your user base is those just single users building dashboards, coming and viewing dashboards. How do you think about that in comparison to the revenue side? Yeah, I think there there will always be a free side to Dean. I think historically, the free side has been sort of pretty, like infinite free <laughs> in a sense, but as we sort of figure out where the right sort of how the right ways to slice it and probably do and we've experimented a, a couple of times and honestly the first time we tried something it didn't work and people didn't like it so we had to change that and the situation is better now what's that story but yeah well we created pricing plans and then they were expensive and didn't contain what users wanted so that's a problem if you're a needle based off in your register so on. So we had to go back to the drawing board, redo that, and here we are. It's amazing how much you have to pivot in a startup, but also in an industry that is changing and growing so much. How do you plan for pivoting? Do you do like monthly pivot sessions where you're like, okay, where's the next pivot coming? Like you're a small I wish. So like that obviously makes it easier to pivot, you know, small teams, you're very agile. It's not like you're a thousand people, change management, all that BS that you have to deal with at the corporate level. So that makes it easy. But like, I'm just curious, what is your strategy planning approach or how do you make sure that you're able to pivot constantly? Yeah. So when you say pivot, I think of like very big changes, like changing from a community data platform to something else. But I think what is, that is often necessary. We have them out in Dune, right? But what needs to happen at a more frequent basis is learning and looking at the stuff that you're doing and figuring out 
do you continue doing it? Do you drop doing it? Do you change what you're doing? Do you lean in? And we don't have a process for that, although we've become a lot more deliberate in how we plan our work, like in thinking about, you know, is this really the most impactful thing for our users? We've shifted our thinking to measure the impact of what we do. Like, I think there is, there are stages companies go through where like in the beginning, you're just two founders and you're just shipping things and then you start doing something else. But as the company grows and there are more people, you have the capacity to ship more things. And maybe a lot of those things don't make sense, in which case you need to sort of consolidate or figure out how to move forward. And so like the key thing we rely on is like our OKR process. It's pretty standard. Quarterly. OKR is nice. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right now that's like corporate DN. Uh, yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And that's like for better or worse, like we didn't want to invent any way to to prioritize or, or to to move forward. But at the very least, like we we take a good hard look every quarter. Mm-hmm. Nice. Okay. Before we wrap up, one final question, and then I want to get to a speed round. I've got some fun questions for you. I just want to ask, like, it seems like you must have just a wealth of data that you and I'm sure members of your team, and this kind of connects into the OKR question, are salivating about like ideas about like, hey, we should do this with the data. We should do that. Is there for you personally, like, is there any untapped potential that you find yourself, you know, dreaming about or waking up in the middle of the night and writing down in your phone about <laughs> that you can share with us? I think there are two things that I dream about. One is making all that data accessible through Marsh Irish models. And my team will laugh at me when I say that here, because I say that all the time in Terry. The second thing is making, so Dune is great at answering like big questions and big and analytical questions. You can't really use Dune for, you know, your application or your any anything operational. And I think where I personally aspire is like, and where I salivate, if you will, is like trying to see how Dune can use this data in a more operational fashion. Because as you mentioned, there's a wealth of it. There's hundreds of terabytes and more pouring in every day, right? And so we know that people don't only have a need to, you know, do analytics, understand how people are using applications. They also have a need to build those applications. And so while we haven't done any major strides in this direction, I think it's pretty natural to think about it, how these two things fit together. And so, yeah, if you catch me with a coffee staring into the air, that's the the two (laughs) things. I don't envy you in the, it's so exciting to be part of, you know, founding a company that's grown so fast and has been so successful and is now such a household name in the space. But then also that brings with it this like burden of opportunity where, you know, you got somebody like Kyle who's coming with his marketing mind, who's got all these big ideas, you know, you're bringing your engineering, your operational mind, you got big ideas. It must be a lot of fun when you guys get together and brainstorm, but it also must be completely overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, it's both fun and challenging, obviously. And that's the thing. I think there's a lot of opportunity in crypto, right? For you, for any company, for any individual who wants to build or create. Like the key thing is to say no and prioritize and place your bets. You can't do everything. And It's better to do a few things at a time sequentially than it is to try to do them all at the same time. And I think Dune historically has been pretty good at that. But of course, when you hire more people, it's tempting, you know, to just do one more thing at the same time and then one more and then one more. So focus is pretty important. And maybe, maybe the thing that is the most difficult, right? Because you have marketing geniuses and genius engineers and genius salespeople and genius product manager. And there are all these valid directions and opportunities for a company like you and sort of placing the right bet is challenging. And I think that's the, I guess, always the role of the founder to, 
to play a part in that, but yeah, it's not a, an easy one. Well, good luck to you, sir. Hat tip. You're doing great so far. Just keep doing what you're doing. Before we jump into a speed round, I just want to give you a chance to tell people where they can find you online, where they can follow you, and any any shill you have for for Dune. Maybe you want to get everybody to try Create One or something like that to really push this large language model progress that you're working on. For sure. So you can find me on virtually any platform with my handle M E W W T S. It's a terrible handle, but I've had it since I was a teenager. So I'll just stick with it. I'm mostly active on Twitter and I used to be a big GitHub user. Unfortunately, I now lead a team. And so my coding days are, are paused. My shill for, D- for Dune or for the audience is, yeah, try, try out our AI features. I think you'll love them. We're working on the UX, making it more prominent, making it easier to find. These are building blocks into a bigger vision that lets you interact with Dune using natural language. If you help us now by asking a question, that data is valuable to us and how we build for the future. So if you're a person out there that does not know how to write SQL, um, try it. And uh, yeah, we'll be super thankful for that. Awesome. Okay. Speed round. First question. What's an NFT you'll never sell? So this is funny because I don't own a single PFP because I missed that wave completely focusing on Dune. And so before I knew it, it was the peak of, you know, the NFT bull market. And so I missed that book completely for good or bad. But for good. You know, I think for good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was pretty envious of some like PFPs on Twitter back in the day. So I was like, damn, I should have bought that penguin or whatever. <laughs> and so I, I actually nearly bought, I nearly bought a PFP the other day and I was like, I can't spend a hundred dollars on this. Like, <laughs> so I'm, uh, yeah. Anyways, the NFTs I can sell are naturally not PFP, so Popes and Git Popes are pretty proud of actually having contributed to Go Ethereum in 2019, and I got a Git Pope for that. That's the only thing I got, but I'm pretty proud of that, so I won't sell it. I don't think you can. It's a pull out, right? You can't sell them. <laughs> <laughs> They're sold on NFTs. <laughs> okay, one prediction for the rest of 2023. I have nothing to base this prediction off, but I'll phrase it as a hope. And that on-chain summer, base, up stack, all that's coming on, friend tech, <laughs> that it had keeps it. on gaining momentum because I'm having a lot of fun and I know a lot of other people are having a lot of fun and the energy is different. And so if we all just use friend tech, everything's going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> Part of me wants to clip that and put that, and Fred Tech would just love it, and that would go totally viral. But the other part of me is like, ooh, speculative, janky app, dangerous, dangerous. Yeah, it's it's pretty janky, but it's fun at least. And I think that's like one of the cool things with being in crypto is that there's a lot of fun, weird stuff. Name another industry that has this these weird dynamics. And I think that's what brought us, me and Frederick, to the industry in the first place and what keeps us there for the long term is part of that quirkiness, part of that ambition of like changing the financial system, making a better world. Like this last week, our head of finance and I have been trying to KYC at a major financial institution. It is impossible for June, pretty big company to do. And so... I don't know. Something's a little bit broken at the very least. For sure. For sure. And it's, you got to have fun along the way. I just, I always think about crypto is the only space where you could go into a Twitter space and a bunch of people are making goblin noises for two hours straight and then jumping off. Like there's no other, no other space in the world that's like that. Okay. Last question. If you had a billboard that 1 billion people were going to see, what would you write on it? Dude, look how <laughs> big marketer now, not an engineer. Market in my somewhere. Of... I don't know. That's I, it. You're allowed to say that. Know. That's you're not the only one that's that's answered that question with a marketing mind. I, I feel like I could also like swing something like don't ban AI or like open source 
Like we can't ban open source AI. Open source AI is the best thing. Maybe I'll put that. Yeah. Open source AI is the best thing. It's, open, it's, a, it's a big message right now. It's an important yeah. message. Matt, yeah. thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Incredible to hear your story. Very excited to continue to be active users of Dune. Shout out to you and your whole team. What you guys are building is amazing. We're so grateful for all your effort in the space. It's been a joy. Thank you for being a Dune user and for having me. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thanks for listening in, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy, your one trusted source to capitalize on the next big phase of the internet. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and subscribe or follow so that you don't miss the next one. While you're at it, there's a link in the description for our free newsletter where we provide timely and relevant Web3 insights so you can confidently build and invest in Web3. Make sure to subscribe today. One final note. This podcast is for educational purposes only and nothing we say is financial advice. Crypto and Web3 are risky and you should never invest more than you're willing to lose. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.